Okay, today we're going to be covering a important topic, uh, cerebral hemorrhages. Uh, obviously important because this is life-threatening and uh, it's important that you diagnose and treat it right away. Uh, in this video, we'll be primarily going over the underlying pathology uh, and how to diagnose it, not necessarily treatment, uh, this is for the purposes of step one. So um, what are the cerebral hemorrhages? Uh, there are four main types. Uh, the first one is going to be the epidural hemorrhage, uh, which happens within the dura matter, in between the two layers of dura matter. Uh, the second type is the subdural hemorrhage, which happens immediately below the dura matter and above the arachnoid matter. Uh, the third one is going to be the subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which happens uh, under the arachnoid matter. And finally, we're going to have the intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, which happens within the brain. Okay, so before we begin, it's important to kind of go over the meninges. I have a video on this that I would refer you to, but uh, just, just for t right now, I'll just go over it real quickly. Uh, first, we have the skull. This is your skull. Uh, immediately below that we have the dura matter and the dura, this dura matter is made up of two layers which are actually attached to each other but I'm going to kind of make some space in between. So this is a dura matter made up of two layers, one attached to the skull which is the periosteal layer and the other one, the, the lower one is called the meningeal layer. Uh, after that we have the arachnoid matter which dips into the fox cerebri, that's the arachnoid matter. And finally, um, after that, we have the well, just, uh, the pia matter, which uh, follows the grooves of the brain. So it's heavily invested into the brain. And the reason why the arachnoid matter is called the arachnoid matter is because it has these uh, projections inside. And arachnoid stands for a spider. It's kind of like the spider legs. And this in the subarachnoid space, which is be below the... Uh, arachnoid matter that is where your cerebral spinal fluid is going through so let's get to, uh, let's delve into the um, epidural hemorrhage first so epidural hemorrhage like I mentioned earlier is caused by a hemorrhage in between the two layers of the dura matter so what is the uh, artery that's involved so there's a little artery right here which is known as the middle meningeal artery and so that is in between the two dura matters and when that ruptures it leads to blood coming out in both directions this one this way and one that way and covering this whole area here uh, just so you can see the um, where the middle meningeal artery comes from let me just draw a scroll so this is looking at someone from the top this is their nose this is their ears uh, here we have the cell tersica, we have the projections here, and here we have the foramen magnum. Now, the middle meningeal artery comes from the foramen spinosum, which is a foramen that's just lateral to the cell tersica. And when it comes out, it goes laterally, and then it splits into two positions there. And so whenever there is any trauma coming from this side, it can lead to the rupture of the middle meningeal artery and then blood will flow in between these two dura matter layers. Um, so let's get this all written down. Um, this is going to be caused by uh, trauma to the middle meningeal artery. Uh, caused by uh, tr tr trauma to the lateral head. Lateral part of the head. Uh, now symptom, uh, symptoms Let's talk about symptoms here. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, they will first be unconscious because of the trauma. Then they will have something called a lucid interval. They'll be fine for a few hours. Uh, they'll be awake, they'll seem fine, and then suddenly they go into a coma. So as soon as you see this lucid interval, you need to make sure that uh, you ad address what's going on here. Now. The other symptom that you'll have is a cranial nerve 3 palsy. And this is palsy, sorry. Okay, and this is 
uh, if you've forgotten, is when the pupil goes down and out, and you have constriction of the pupil as well. So the eyes down and out, constriction, uh, head trauma, you definitely want to think about this. Now, CT findings, um, so let's, see, let's talk about investigations, which you would do. You would be doing CT. This is primarily diagnosed by CT, clinically a little bit, but uh, your biggest thing here is your CT. Let's take a look at one here. Um, now, in the CT, you'll notice it's a lens shape. And that's what it called, that's what it's called right here. So it's a nice lens shape. And what creates this lens shape is the fact that there's two, I guess you could say fissures right here, that it can't pass. The dura matter is kind of, I guess you could say stapled in certain areas, and it cannot pass those areas, so it makes this characteristic lens shape. Um, so let's just write this, let's get this written down. So this is a characteristic lens shape. And what you also want to remember is that it does not, doesn't cross uh, these fissures. Actually, that's what it's called, fissures. But it does cross the fox cerebri and the tentorium. And so you can kind of see that here as the brain is being pushed in both those directions, it can uh, cause that. So that's epidural hemorrhage. Uh, kind of in a nutshell there. Uh, the second thing that we're going to be discussing is going to be the subdural hemorrhage. So this is going to be immediately under the dura matter. So I'm going to go back to my uh, original diagram. So here we have a dura matter. In the subdural hemorrhage, we're going to be looking at this area right here, this entire area. Now, um, what happens here is we have these vessels. Uh, veins actually which go from the brain up to the skull so let me just get this darkened up so you have this vessel here now what happens is if the brain ever experiences any f you know if this part of the brain down here moves forward and backwards this part of the artery will be moving while this the top part of the artery will be stationary and this will lead to, you know, if it's severe enough, it'll lead to, let me get red on there. Oh, on there? Okay, there's red. Okay, it'll lead to rupture, he it'll rupture here and blood will flow in this area. Now, what, what, what kind of predisposes you to this? Any type of brain atrophy. Because if you have brain atrophy, the brain is going to be much lower and so then uh, this is going to be, you know, kind of stress will be higher and then more movement will cause uh, it to rupture more easily. So let's kind of get this written down here. So first thing that I mentioned was it's caused by the bridging vein. That vein that I had drawn earlier, it's called the bridging vein. That's kind of the colloquial term, the technical term, superior cerebral vein. So it's going to be uh, damaged the superior cerebral vein. It occurs uh, between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. Now, symptoms, what, would, what can we expect from symptoms? Remember, this is a vein, so it's very slow bleeding. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time to present clinically, and oftentimes, patient won't remember what caused it. Uh, again, anything that can cause severe shaking can cause this. Uh, so, uh, so generally there will be some history of trauma, either a fall uh, after epilepsy because of the violent shaking of the body and the head, or even a uh, motor vehicle accident, I mean, dealing with high speeds. There are some things that can predispose to this old age, because as, as the patient gets older, brain starts to atrophy, and alcohol as well. Uh, brain will start to atrophy. So what kind of investigation would you do? Uh, let's, let's take another... C Again, your primary mode is CT. CT scan of the brain. So we have here. In this, the classic pattern is an, ellip an elliptical pattern, kind of like a crescent moon. So a crescent pattern or elliptical pattern uh, is your thing here. Now, if, ask yourself, does this get blocked by fissures? Obviously not, because the fissures are in the dura matter. So this is not stops at fissures. It does it or let me let me make it let me write a little bit better. It crosses the fissures. 
that's how it's kind of written in uh, books. But um, it does not cross the Fox and Tentorium uh, cerebri. Uh, so that's uh, subdural hemorrhage there. Uh, next, we're going to be looking at subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. And as the name kind of says, uh, it's going to be under the arachnoid matter. So if I can go back to my image here, um, we have uh, some sort of rupture in this area, primarily arteries found within the, uh, around the circle of Willis berry aneurysms. And so this area here has, you know, just to recall here, it has CSF. There's CSF running around here. So once you have hemorrhage, it gets mixed with blood. And so if you do an LP, you will see blood in the LP. And that's how uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is diagnosed, not necessarily with uh, CT scan. Um, and so what do we have here? Primarily berry aneurysms uh, around the circle of Willis. And what predisposes to berry aneurysm? This would be kind of a review. Achler Danlos syndrome. These patients and Marfans are predisposed to it. Also, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Just to recall, that's when you have you know a lot of uh, cysts in the kidneys and the liver and uh, sometimes the spleen. Also, it's been associated with uh, berry aneurysms and um, AV malformations as well. Uh, symptoms? Classically, it's always been associated with the statement by patients as having the worst headache ever. It's very sudden onset, very painful, and, <coughs> and there's no history of trauma at all. Um, a complication that does occur is sometimes there's vasospasm. This has to do something with the blood products, um, and this cannot be detected by CT. So uh, you kind of have to look at the uh, symptoms there, and this is going to come on like a stroke. So the patient will have stroke-like symptoms, you know, suddenly can't move or can't feel something. Uh, and the treatment for this, very, very important to know this, is nemetapine. And this is a calcium channel blocker, which will kind of loosen up the uh, underlying uh, artery there. Uh, final, the final one is intracerebral, so four. Uh, intracerebral. This is within the brain, does not really have to do with meninges. Um, and this is usually caused by, you know, systemic hypertension, which is uncontrolled for a long time, starts to, starts to weaken the vein, veins, uh, arteries in the uh, brain and leading to microaneurysms, uh, particularly the uh, lenticulate striate. Um, which is known as the charcot bouchard or in the basal ganglia. There are some conditions associated with this. Uh, uh, amyloid angiopathy is associated with this. Uh, a lot of vasculitis can cause this as well. And finally, uh, even some neoplasms have been associated with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, but pri primarily uncontrolled, long-standing long systemic hypertension uh, causes.